Hello, and welcome to episode 14 of Sports Betting Conversations. Today, we're speaking with Sim One Sports, and the episode is titled Virtual Sports Powering 24-7, 365 Fantasy Sports Contest Live from the Metaverse. Today, we're joined by David Ortiz, founder and CEO at Sim One Sports, and Tom Getty, CMO at Sim One Sports. And as always, I'm joined by Kevin Twitchell. Well, David and Tom, thank you again for uh, joining us today. Uh, David, we'll start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get to where you are today? Sure. Uh, so I have been in the video games and real money gaming business now for since I'm 19. So going on 29 years now. Um, started at Atari Midway. Uh, worked on a game called Wayne Gretzky 3D Hockey, which was which was a fun one back when you know, it was still arcade as well as as well as a console. I uh, was over at Microsoft uh, as a, as a, the first game designer there. And I uh, worked on a product called NFL Fever, you know, some games on the Xbox Live platform. I uh, was at EA Sports with Tom for a long time as a senior producer on Madden NFL. And then we we, we did a fantasy sports startup together, um, and which we had some success with. And now we are uh, building out Simwin. So, been, you know, lifelong career video game creator um, with a pretty heavy emphasis on sports over the years. Excellent. Thank you. And I. Uh, Tom, would you, yeah. would you care to share a little by yourself? Yeah. Absolutely. Tom Getty, CMO here at Simwin Sports. Uh, actually, really similar story to David's, but from the marketing side. So 30 years in video games and real money gaming. Uh, I started my video game career at a small company called Humongous Entertainment, which is known for the cult classics, backyard sports, backyard baseball, football, soccer, that still get referenced on ESPN and in our hardcore sports channels today. Um uh, we sold that company to what eventually became Atari. Uh, I moved on to Wizards of the Coast. I was there during the Pokemon trading card game boom uh, when we went from $175 million in revenue to $750 million in a single year, which is a crazy ride. Uh, we sold the company to Hasbro during that time as well, uh, and then it moved on to EA Sports, as David said, our, our first of three tours duty together. Um, I uh, was at EA Sports for 13 years. Uh, the last seven of which I managed marketing across uh, the EA Sports brand globally. Um, moved on, David and I had had our, our first fantasy sports company together. Uh, and then when we exited that, I went on to DraftKings. I was the chief marketing officer at DraftKings, uh, launched all their first sports books, took them public, all that good stuff, uh, and then retired during the pandemic to do board work. Uh, I've been on the board of this company since its inception, and a little over a year ago, came off the bench to uh, get it out of the wash. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So I guess for the novices out there, tell us a little about Simwin. What, what is this company all about? Sure. So, I mean, we look at Simwin as a sports entertainment company, uh, as as kind of the core of what it is. But the way we you know express that is you know, we looked at kind of the psychology around gaming. We looked at the psychology and the play patterns around how people interact with content and content is now digital and, and bingeable. That's pretty much how everyone experiences a pastime, whether it's, you know, Hulu, Netflix, movies, music, video games, online poker, online slots, you know, you name it, people want content on demand and, and they're able to get it. There's really no uh, business out there where, you know, the entertainment space where you can't get content on demand. However, sports business, which is wildly popular. I think the last numbers I saw, it said it's, Growing to be a seven hundred billion dollar business in the next two years, um, it only operates a fraction of the time, and so you know, uh, really probably about thirty percent because human athletes have to rest, and you know, the fantasy sports industry, the real money gaming industry, it's all built around people kicking a ball, throwing a ball, catching a ball, slapping a puck, and um, they can't do that all the time. They're human; they have to rest, and there's seasonality in sport. So we looked at that, and we said, well, we could have digital sports leagues where we own the content entirely. So. We build out our own football, our own basketball, our own soccer, our own hockey, our own cricket, boxing, baseball, et cetera. And we could have these digital teams with, with great AI where the players get bigger, stronger, faster, and they atrophy, and they have real salaries, and they have real owners. Um, we could build out a sports league that could run all the time um, for every sport and, uh, and have digital athletes that you know we could have populate these teams and, and let the fans own the players and uh, let interesting people own the teams. and. That's what we've done. So essentially, you know, the most succinct way I can put it after that long ramble is, you know, we've built the sports metaverse where we're allowing the ecosystem to find different ways to be a part of that. And um, and ultimately our goal is to be able to have sports running 
all the time and everything that happens around it from fantasy sports, real money gaming, sports collectibles, video games happen around our content and symbol. Mm, very interesting. Um, now, uh, talk about like some of the, um, uh, uh, I guess the, the betting side of things or, um, or investment side of things like, uh, of the teams and they're, I know when we had our pre-talk with Tom, there were, you know, there were, there were some interesting information, uh, not only like who is participating in, uh, at least the football league, but, but also like, like how, what are the dynamics of that? Sure. So you know, out the gate, we didn't want to necessarily go after a licensing relationship with, uh, with, you know, some of the traditional leagues, uh, not that we're not open, ultimately open to that, but we wanted to really kind of carve out the path of what we wanted to execute. But we still wanted that, you know, those relationships that would really bring the credibility to the league for fantasy players, hunters, et cetera, um, and just general fans. And so, you know, we brought on a pretty interesting collection of team owners from, uh, let's see here, Magic Johnson, Tracy McGrady, Marshall Fall, Lavello Ball, uh, Nick Carter from the Backstreet Boys, uh, Mike Singletary, Penny Hardaway, um, Geez, uh, Allen Iverson and Authentic Brands Group partnered together uh, as, as the team owners. Uh, let's see here. Um, the only Jerry Rice. Had, <clears throat> Jerry Rice, yeah, that was Jerry a good Rice. Rice. Marshall Ball. Yeah, a couple of big legends. Um, Keely Smith um, uh, and uh, other partners. And um, it's just a growing and growing list. Um, and so, you know, David Levy, um, uh, just some really, you know, Craig Fox, uh, Ken Mock. Uh, it's it's a long list of interesting people. Suzanne DePast and um, Jen Welter, the first woman to coach in the NFL. Um, just a lot of interesting people to own and operate these teams in our league. And then above and beyond that, um, you know, obviously the fans are going to have the opportunity to to own the players. Um, each player is an individual NFT. But we wanted to structure a league where it could get attraction and attention and eyeballs, um, and also have credibility. So we wanted good people around operating and running these teams, people with credibility. People who really understand um, sport, and um, so we, we we checked that box, and uh, and then from there, you know, it was about building something that um, we thought could be uh, you know pretty special in terms of its overall content, and we feel like we've done that as well with our first offering, which is American Football, in terms of the content mm-hmm. of the game itself and what it can do. And, and how how would I consume uh, the, the content, like as a fan, let's say, or an observer? Like, where, where can I watch these simulations or or these simulations are just end results? And how does that work? So the games are actually coached. So, you know, we have these digital teams. And the best way for people to think about this is everything you know about, you know, the professional, the major professional sports leagues or football, basketball, soccer, hockey. So you know, what you know about the NFL, the NBA, MLB, you know, um, FIFA, et cetera, uh, Premier League. Um, We've basically done our digital version of of sports, and uh, the owners, operators of these teams, rather than it being about you know how good they are on the sticks and pressing buttons and controlling it, it's about them setting the strategy. So drafting the right team, signing the right players, and then being able to you know improve their growth, improve their development. But on game day, rather than you know just being a pure sim, they're calling the plays and setting the strategy, or they kind of preset the behavior they want their team to do. And then the AI plays it out, but there's no human influence on the physical like controller of a player. It's all it's like beating Bill Belichick or Mike Tomlin on the sidelines, setting the strategy, right. calling the plays, building the team, and uh, and then and then it off it off it goes. And so they'll be able to see that um, our site is simwinsports.com. We go live uh, here in, in a few weeks, and they'll be able to go there. And as far as being able to consume it. You can consume it on your mobile device. You can consume it on your desktop. Um, pretty much anywhere where you have a connection, we've optimized for both. You don't need to go through an app store. You can just literally go to our site and uh, consume on anywhere you are in the world on your device. Wow, so that's correct. and that's twenty four seven, right? So 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 when we when we get live and we're live, and I want to watch Magic's Magic Johnson's team. You know, Tom, on your side, from the marketing side, is there a schedule? Am I jumping in live and, and I'm just hoping to see it or, you know, in this 24-7 environment? I think it's really cool because 
you know, program TV is you wait for Sunday for your, your game. You know, will I be waiting for Magic's game and watching another cricket game? Or how's that going to work as far as a kind of a programming the clock as they would do in traditional? Sure. These games run 24-7, 365. So you can get, you know, American football action Tuesday at 2 a.m. in July. Uh, no more off seasons, no pandemic shutdowns, no labor stoppages, none of that good stuff. So um, you tune in anytime you want. We will run separate channels uh, for each individual sport so that all sports will be running um, 24-7 as, as described. Now, when you drop in, there's only one game going on at a time. We don't stack games. You're not choosing an instance to view everyone, whether you're playing fantasy sports or you're sports betting through partnerships or uh, you're playing our in-game um, uh, fantasy contest. We're all watching the exact same game run at the same time, but we're pooling the liquidity from all these different partners all around the world uh, into these different contests that that we're running. So, um, yes, you would need to note the schedule if you want to sp- very specifically watch Magic Johnson's LA Magic take the field uh, with him at quarterback. Um, but you can tune in anytime, day or, day or night, and get live action. That's cool. From hockey to cricket. Yeah, like I said, you know, we'll run these basically as individual channels. So once we're built out and we have all eight of the sports that we have planned running, then you just choose which sport you want to watch and and go in. But it it makes for really interesting programming from our side because, you know, we're encouraging eventually there will be a layer over the top that is going to be encouraging players to go to where the hottest action is. Um, So we're chasing time zones around the world obviously cricket isn't going to be the most popular in north america right. uh, to begin with um but we're chasing those time zones as well as uh the individual sport interests so the ability to kind of red zone cover across all the sports eventually is going to be a really interesting dynamic oh that'd be that that is interesting to have red zone across sports instead of just uh that's, that's, yeah. that's great. That's, that's all cool. we watch. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we're on a Sunday. It just, just goes. It just literally goes. That's a problem for you, right? <laughs> right so, you know, we talk a lot about sports betting, obviously, on this and technology. And, you know, Russell touched on earlier, where does now, we kind of have a better understanding of now we've got your channel, we've got your programming. Now, where does this other angle come in with the sports betting and and, and, and who are your partners in that world? So we run uh, we run fantasy contests uh, first party. So just like the NFL, yes. every day everybody else and you own that. And That's we your own plan. that. We run it ourselves. From a le- regulatory standpoint, we cannot be the house and run the league. Obviously, so we partner. Uh, we license our data streams and our content out to um, out to uh, partner sportsbook and fantasy companies, um, in which. And then they're allowed to run lines uh, and um, uh, and do that. The one big advantage they have there, there's a few big advantages, but um, we always partner our content and our data together. So whatever device you're on anywhere in the world, as long as it's a legal regulated territory, um, you can watch the games and be making your picks all from a single screen. And depending on what the partner wants, uh, that can look very different, right? So for brick and mortar, uh, you know, at the end of the night, Sunday night, when the last NFL game shuts off, we can click over and continue um, uh, that sportsbook partnership there. We can run them on their platforms, uh, you know, so we could be embedded into the Caesars app. Uh, we would even go so far as gray labeling. Um, so if, uh, you know, whatever, FanDuel wanted this to be the FanDuel Football League powered by SimWin, uh, we'd be happy to do that as well. So, but the, I think the most interesting thing we do as far as those partnerships are concerned, though, as I as I described earlier, is regardless of where the players are coming from on the platform, they're all watching the same instance. They're all everyone is watching one game, uh, which is a massive advantage from an advertising standpoint because we sell advertising just as uh, traditional sports league do, um, uh, making sure our liquidity stays high uh, through all different time zones and places in the world, all that good stuff. So. There's a lot of new challenges with uh, running 24/7 sports leagues, um, but we've got some pretty uh, pretty sensible answers and pretty smart people involved, uh, you know, kind of paving the way for us. Matt, from a technology perspective, and I would say please keep it high level for the general audience, but <laughs> there seems you know 
it appears there's a lot of complexity here. You know, uh, you know, a number of integrations in place today, and I think that will just further expand as you uh, go live with additional sports and additional partnerships. Um, uh, how I guess difficult was it to kind of you know start things up and get the foundational uh, you know part of your let's say tech stack down because uh, it's a lot to plan for, right? Because what you're doing is, you know, kind of broad. Um, how did that process go, and how painful was it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 a labor of love, honestly. Uh, I mean, there's really nothing else we would either of us would probably be doing other than maybe coaching. You know, our, our kids be out there, um, which we still make time to do as well. But in terms of the tech stack and how complicated it was, I think probably the biggest uh, feedback to that is. As we were talking about what we were doing in year one, the feedback we kept getting from everyone we talked to, from investors to strategics is, wow, that's really ambitious, which is code for, there's no way you guys are going to build all that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, we, we, we approached it from a perspective of kind of bottom up of, you know, we want to have great looking content. We want to be able to bring on different partners easily. We want to be able to build dynamic stadiums and, and have tools where ultimately fans can tweak a player to the lowest detail or team uniforms, alternates, like all the, like the stuff that like hardcore sports junkies love about, you know, uniforms and stadiums and players and attributes and dynamic. And so we built out a series of editors on our tech stack at, at, at its base, right? Is the ability to create sports content, teams, uniform, stadium players, and AI, uh, and then a player progression system. And we're fortunate in addition to you know, myself and the team, we've got some really talented guys, you know, like Josh Luman, who worked with SEA for a long, long time as our lead designer, you know, and Randy Beverly, uh, you know, amongst these guys, you know, JY and Zay, we have a collective set of experience. So it was challenging, but at the same time, we knew the entire time how to do this because we'd all done it so many times. Uh, it was just about then improving on what we, you know, we wanted to do, but it, from a bottom up, high level, our tech stack, you know, is a series of sports editors that allows us to build out any sport you know, very rapidly now that we've built the foundation. And then our platform for fantasy allows us to reuse both what we do for the daily fantasy um, as well as what we do for the in-play prediction system across any sport. So now that we've got the plumbing laid, we are just plugging in the different sports. And it's about tuning the AI um, for each individual sport appropriately. But camera systems, stadiums, all of these things that it takes to do, you know, triple A quality uh, sports presentation, we've been able to really modularize that and and do some cool stuff. And uh, how has the recent emergence of you know Chat GPT or you know similar? You know, I think people we've been talking about AI ML, you know, for I don't know about five to ten years now, and nobody knows what the heck it means. But now I think people can equate right chat gp2 to ai because it's being used um uh you know kind of broadly you know across you know social mediums the news and what have you so people are starting to kind of piece those things together but how's the emergence of you know, technologies like chat gpt um affected your you know strategy in terms of you know technical approach and and, and even approach of the product itself well, one of the biggest things, you know, um, you know, our, we did with that, um, and we're looking at that kind of additional tech beyond the AI we've been building was the storytelling, right? So one of the mm. one of the things we want to do to bring to life is we got to tell the stories of all these players. So yeah, we've got the Jerry Rice's and the Magics, and the Iversons and the Marshall Falks. You know those guys, but then we've mm. got all these other players that they're playing against that you don't know. So how do we tell their story? You know, and how do we report on all these games without having to have a gigantic army, you know, like, the, you know, and so we started looking at AI solutions there and we ran some tests around being able to feed information in about the teams, about the players and about the outcome and see what kind of stories it can be written. And I think that's, you know, the side, um, and I probably shouldn't be saying this to journalists, but that's probably the side where, you know, we're going to get a lot of run and traction in, in the short term. Now we approach the product as being able to we, you know, the backstory and report on what's happening in volume, um, leveraging AI to do that. Interesting. 
that's where you know where data are right, we're, we're from data are where we get excited about technology you know that's where we, we've been involved in companies from FanDuel to Betfair and and in the music industry um, building really sophisticated systems and immersive platforms and video games so when we looked at your platform Russell and I were like this is this is amazing there's going to be some crazy innovative technology coming so when you look at when you scale what do you think from your CTO hat putting on your CTO hat what are you most excited about launching with and and kind of scaling this this platform and this product as far as technology man well uh geez i, th- I think it's just about finding ways to get things in in everyone's hands so i think about you know level of control that we can ultimately put the fans so at our core it's this game where we add this co- you know this this virtual sports world where all these things are happening these players are growing they're getting cut we've got our old college and the amateur system where these players are coming up, and that's really this living and breathing, breathing organism of people controlling players and coaching and running team. But it's all digital, right? And then we think, and it's this professional league, right? And then we think about, well, look, we've done all this to mirror what's happening in the, you know, in, in the world of professional sport. What feeds it? And so then we start thinking about, well, that next layer of being able to allow fans to control their own amateur teams build up their own players, which they were able to do with the ecosystem, let them start even earlier, have a separate area where they can do that, have that retail side of it where people can play and control their own amateur teams and build that up and putting the tech and tools in their hand, they can go to a level of customization, which really makes them feel like they own it right. and it's their extension, right? Not everyone's going to be able to run a, a 4 4 4 D, you know, or be able to, you know, jump out the gym. Even if you can, you can't do it forever. But now, um, you know, with this type of system, where we ultimately want to see the tools in people's hands and their ability to create their version of themselves as a, you know, as a digital athlete and see how far they can take it and compete that way. So um, we're excited about that extension that people have those tools in their hands and do that. I, I think also, you know, less about technology, but certainly technology based is how do we present this? What's the broadcast look like? You know, a traditional sports game all the actions on the field, right? All the focus is on the field because that's what people are toning in for. We're different. Like, yes, we have the action on the field, but the competition is actually the coaches. So we need to call them in like a sideline reporter would, uh, but we can call them in in competition because it's you know not the same experience, right? So right. bring them in in picture in picture. But that's not the only competition either. We also got the fantasy sports stuff going. So bring guys from the top of the leaderboard uh, into the broadcast. What do you what do you think is going to happen next? Who do you think it's going to get off and and save this for you? Bring it across the money line. So you know uh, there are technology there there are technology challenges. They're not the biggest challenges to overcome. But how do you uh, how do you um, you know find your way to entertainment, valid you know real entertainment, so that people are actually enjoying the broadcast and not just tuning in to see if they won or not. Uh, right. And then how do you make that as procedural as possible so that it's running 24 7 365 um you know that's i think is is you know one of the bigger technology challenges as well as all right let's identify fun and then how do we make fun run on its own that's that's a big challenge but that's more in design than technology but it it, it you know the lives are really blurry with this product and and engagement I mean, really, really the biggest thing is that fan engagement, which will probably be all in your world, Tom, you know, like keeping, keeping the fan engaged is going to be, it's probably, probably a, a challenge, but not so much because you have the celebrities, you know, do you see your celebrities, uh, you know, like when we work in music and other places, the celebrities really, when they're involved in these things, they promote them, you know, like I'm going to be, you know, check me out, tune in. Will they be out there promoting themselves and this, do they, do you have this kind of these ambassadors, uh, working with you to help get fan engagement? Well, we spent we, talking about it and their kind of socials and all that kind of stuff. They definitely will be not only because they own these teams, so there's financial benefit for them. For the lead to succeed, for their teams to succeed, for them to win, uh, and not you know be in the bottom of the uh, of of the standings, all those things are really important. But even pushing that farther and encouraging that much farther, we actually set these owners up as affiliates. You know, nobody's tried this before, right? There's virtual sports, but virtual sports today are more like slot machine experiences than what we're doing. So you know, 
This is a wild, wild west. Like it has not been tried. And if you can imagine being an affiliate when online poker just kicked off, people probably made a lot of money. <laughs> as, uh, as as a blue sky and there's no competitors and all those things. And all of our owners uh, have those opportunities. And obviously we've got a network of traditional affiliates pulling from poker and fantasy sports and, and sports betting as well. But um, the owners that have these huge social followings already – uh, you know, stand to do very well by uh, uh, by getting this league up and running. Yeah, I'll, t- I'll add to that too. It's, you know, there's a in addition to them having an affiliate and you know that a percentage of what happens. I, there's a lot of pride here, right? I mean, these guys, the people we were doing the draft it was hilarious. You got guys like you know Manuel Acho, who's one of our team owners, commenting on the fact that he still has real abs versus some of the avatars that maybe be a little bit older. Well, that's great. Some sort of celebs. Like these guys are, they're, they're, they're coming for, you know, they're coming for each other. Not just that, you know, we have, um, you know, we've got athletes who are, are crossing over from sport to sport. So, you know, you've got some really interesting, you know, all time point guards, you know, playing and shooting guards, playing a quarterback. You've got Penny Hardaway playing at free safety, you know, and you got Marshall Falk saying, Hey, look, this is what I do. This is no way you're going to be able to compete with me in this venue. And you got a guy like Alan Iverson. Told us a great story about how you know he used to walk past the gym every day in Georgetown, and uh, and walk past the football field on the way because he was an All-American, I believe All-American. I know he was an All-State football player in high school too. You know, and saying, "Hey, look, I wanted to play every day. Walk into the gym in Georgetown, I had to walk by the football field, and I wanted to be out there too to the point where it tore me up. So now he's getting a chance to play football. You know, I think That's stuff cool. like that. These guys, at the end of the day, they're they're still athletes. They're still passionate. They're still competitive. So. You know, there's going to be all the incentive and opportunity for them to be able to, um, you know, uh, be motivated to bring people on the platform and stay engaged. But I think there's also just a lot of passion here. They like to compete. You know, none of these guys want to lose. Right. Yeah. And the other element that we talked about that we did haven't spoken about on engagement is the players. So every digital player that's running around on the field is an NFT entity as well. And it's owned by fans. Uh, so we sell those individually for about $400. Uh, they have the opportunity, the people that buy the rights, which we call an NFT player agent. Um, uh, so those player agents have the ability to train their player uh, until they are joined on a professional roster. So the fans actually own a piece of this league. And those fans, as they are drafted onto a roster, begin to collect salary from them in in real world cash. We pay it in our token, but you can cash it out immediately. They collect a salary. They can uh, collect performance bonuses. Um, they can collect sponsorship dollars. They get a cut of the fantasy uh, sports revenue based on how popular their player is in the fantasy drafts. So the more their player is drafted, the more they're going to make of that pool. Um, just some really interesting ways. And we're the only Web3 experience uh, that I have come across in which you can purchase that base element, which unlocks all these other revenue opportunities, but you don't have to sell your original um, asset. So, you know, the key to, to um, you know, success in Web3, whether that's NFT or, or crypto or whatever, is convincing the player base or the, uh, the user base to hold on to their assets as long as possible. So the scarcity goes up, so that the, the pricing goes up. Um, with this, like this is, like I said, it's the only experience I've come across in which you can actually pull money out of the system without selling your primary asset. That's interesting. So when can I see my player? You know, so Russell and I want to start buying players. Uh, yeah. How do I how do start getting our NFT? How's people checking in, you know, get their first step in in this? When, when are you going to st- open that up or is it already opened up? So we're flowing this out, um, with the middle of this month, people will be able to jump on and start doing the fantasy tournaments and following along with the teams. It's our preseason kickoff. And then, um, you know, very shortly after that, we'll make the players available for purchase. And then we go into the regular season uh, and they're in the middle of April. And so this is all now. Um, we were still a few weeks away from you to be able to buy a player, but it's coming. It's coming very quickly. And then we have some, you know, some folks who were on our pre are kind of our pre-list a little a little bit back when we first started announcing things, so we'll, we'll take care of them. But you know, in terms of general fan being able to get in there, you know, we're a few weeks out, and then they'll be able to start get their hands on players. Which cool, yeah. And we typically 
kind of close out these interviews by asking, you know, what are you excited about? Uh, you know, that your industry, um, you know, um, or the, the future of industry or what we'll have in the next five years. But it seems like, you know, you don't have that. Uh, I can't, but let me rephrase it. I can't ask you that question because you are the industry. So <laughs> you are the excitement. You're bringing, you're bringing. <laughs> yeah. What's the future of this business? We're looking at it, Russell. Right here. We got it. David and Tom are the future right now. We're, I'm, I'm with the future. You know, it's funny. Since I think since the beginning of when I joined LinkedIn the first time, uh, which was about the time that we had our first fantasy startup, uh, my headline has been driving conversions of sports, real money gaming, and video gaming. And those were very separate, but you know, it's come to fruition. Like this is the culmination of what David and I have done for the last 30 years, not only done it individually, but done it together for the last 30 years. So it is super exciting to bring all that experience into something that the world has never seen before. Um, nobody's attempted anything this, uh, um, you know, ambitious as David said earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, he and the team have done just an amazing job pulling it together. So we're, we're just excited to share it with the world and, and, uh, and, and show everybody what the possibility of the future is. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're really looking forward to seeing it. Um, when it goes live, uh, it sounds like really interesting. It's unique. Um, I think it's a different type of content that people haven't consumed before. So, uh, I don't think there should be an issue getting eyeballs and um, maybe you know, some investment <laughs> from from fans along the way. So yeah, so it's great. Following and then like we talked about earlier offline, checking back in as uh, avatars and doing this in the digital world. Yeah, um, man. In, within your platform, um, you know, it's going to be great to see how young I'll look. Yeah, well, that will be fun. I think that is. <laughs> You know, we have literally this setup where as the game is being broadcast, we can go picture in picture, you know, with multiple people. So, you know, we'll all do avatars. We'll have the game go in the background. We'll, we'll watch some sports. We'll kind of do what, uh, what Eli and, uh, and Peyton do when they're watching Monday night. We'll just sit around. We'll talk about the game. We'll talk about, you know, the action, you know, where we go. And, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll all be digital. Todd we'll will keep his gray beard and I'll be... I'll be fully, you know, Grecian formula. <laughs> <laughs> no, I lo- I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm looking actually forward to, you know, the hockey, as I'm a big hockey fan, you know, and your, your day's going all the way back to the Gretzky games, you know, can't see what you, can't wait to see what you do with, with hockey and, and if you get celebrities involved there. Oh, we're going to do some fun stuff. And it, not just me, I mean, again, one of the reasons why all the games we've made in the past, you know, why they work is we've, it's always been like a good team of people who are passionate about it and get it. So it's not like one person having to be Atlas, and we've got some folks chomping at the bit to do some stuff around hockey, we'll, you know, work me and the rest of the team. That was going to be fun. Cricket's going to be fun. Cricket, Cricket's got me really excited just for the overall global potential. We've got partners that are coming from everywhere wanting to get involved in that one. And then, of course, you know, soccer or football, you yeah. know, that one is going to be fun. Basketball, it's it's just, yeah, it's sports, right? Yeah, it's what, yeah. You know, we get up for every morning. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for taking all this time. Yeah, yeah, this was great. And uh, very informative, a lot of a lot of information, but I think the story was told very well and succinctly. So this was perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you guys. Yes.